hope you don't mind that I don't have slides this morning, but I prefer telling stories. Um, so good morning, my name is Stephanie Morillo. The original title of this talk was going to be opening up the current open source framework, but I'm gonna deviate from that a little bit, not too much, and you'll see why. I wanna talk to you instead about what it means to be remarkable in the tech industry, and I've amassed, um, basically I've pulled from a few data sources which are super scientific, including personal observations, my own biases and assumptions, and also interactions that I've had from the industry. Again, super scientific here. So. What I mean by remarkable, um, being remarkable in technology, basically I've identified three qualities, three very general qualities um, of technologists that are considered to be remarkable. The first one would be someone who has been in the industry for a few years, either as a hobbyist or professional. Someone who has an amazing, uh, sorry, amazing origin story, and also somebody who is known for their amazing accomplishments and contributions to technology. So by that definition, I am by no means remarkable. I am quite unremarkable, but I am remarkable by a different set of standards, and that different set of standards is that I simply exist in this space. To illustrate my point, in open source, um, I've managed to find that about less than 2% of open source contributors are women. Um, I know that the data varies depending on the sources, but I also haven't been able to find the number of people of color in the United States who are contributors to open source. And since I know that I'm a magical unicorn, I'm gonna give you a number anyway, and that's gonna be 15. So there are 15 open source contributors in the whole wide universe who are people of color and contribute to open source. So by that definition, I'm quite remarkable. Um, and I'm gonna say that four of us are women of color in particular. So bear with me here, four of us are women of color who are open source contributors in the whole wide universe. So therefore, I'm remarkable simply because I have made the decision to contribute to open source, whether or not that contribution was um, considered a notable contribution or not, but it was one small step for Stephanie, one smaller step for the project, and one huge ass leap for the rest of the industry because I am in this space. Um, so I've had people marvel at how articulate I am. I've had people marvel at the fact that I know what GitHub is. I have people marvel at the fact that I go to tech conferences even though I'm not a professional developer. And I find it a little annoying at this point for people to be marveling at the fact that I am here because everywhere I go, there are very few like me in the space. So let's go through the different qualities that remarkable technologists have. I'll start with the first one, which is having been in the industry for a few years. I got my start in programming three years ago on my friend Steven's couch. It was the start of what would turn out to be a full year of unemployment. It was not fun employment. It was not, I have $30,000 in the bank and I'm gonna take some time off to learn how to code. It was very much, I'm collecting unemployment benefits. I'm hustling on the side. I'm looking for jobs and I wanted to learn how to code because my friend Steven told me that I could get a job and a job was the first thing that I needed to pay my bills and keep food in my belly. So I didn't have a device that was suited to the task. In fact, when I first started to learn how to code, I had a Windows machine, and Steven was like, yeah, this is not gonna cut it. So he gave me an old Dell laptop that he just installed Ubuntu on, and I'd meet up with him at his house once a week on his couch, going through tryruby.org for about five weeks before we even went on into writing my own program. So in the beginning, I was very motivated. I found it very exciting. I don't have a very strong math or science background in spite of the fact that I am the daughter of an engineer from the Dominican Republic who was unable to practice engineering here in the US when he emigrated over because he didn't have a degree from an American university. So my dad was a bench mechanic and he it wholly entrusted me and my brother to the educational system. So, I really liked coding, but I found it very hard to concentrate. It's really, diff learning how to program is difficult enough, but when you're going through a very difficult life circumstance and being unemployed, I assure you, is a very difficult life circumstance, it can be borderline traumatizing. I turned down various opportunities that year to attend conferences, to teach someone how to learn how to code for 50 bucks a week, simply because I was ashamed of the fact that I was a newbie and I didn't want to be exposed at any conferences for being new. Um, also, there weren't many people that looked like me or came from my background, and I was ashamed to be asked the question, what do you do for a living, only to have to answer, nothing at the moment, do you wanna give me a job? So, so my big break in tech happened around the one year mark of being unemployed. Everything came to a head at one day in March 2013. 
This particular day, I was three weeks into a intro to Rails course, which I was able to take at a, at a hugely discounted rate because I was unemployed. Um, learning how to create an app, I really didn't fully understand it. And the hard drive that, uh, and the hard drive in the computer that Steven loaned me completely gave out. I lost my project, all of the work that I was doing. My phone charger blew up, and the anniversary of me being unemployed was looming. So I was very emotional this day. So I call Steven up crying and I tell him, you know what, Steven, I think I'm gonna give up programming. I think this is shit. What I need right now is a job. I don't need to be sold a dream. This is very difficult and I just don't know how I'm gonna get to tomorrow. So Steven asked me to meet him at a Starbucks that evening. And he reinstalled a new hard drive. And he explained to me, he explained MVC to me with his chicken scratch handwriting on a piece of paper, something that I wasn't able to comprehend in three weeks of taking this course and in a year of learning how to program on his couch. And at the end, I stopped crying. My eyes were still red and I said, I understand now. And he said, that's great. Do you wanna be the teaching assistant in my 10 week backend web development course at General Assembly? And in a moment, I was employed. <laughs> so my first job in tech was teaching others how to code. And it was the job that saved me from poverty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I then, was, um, uh, I then was offered full-time employment at General Assembly and the positions that I was in, um, I was put in these positions because I had an affinity for tech and I was interfacing with the tech community a lot. So um, I became the program manager for the coding bootcamp in New York City and then joined the marketing team and I continued to stay on as a technical assistant in the backend web development course. Um, and I'm really excited to say that this Monday I start um, a new job at DigitalOcean as a copywriter. And that's all thanks to Steven. So the second element to being considered remarkable in this industry is having an origin story. I don't have the archetypal I've been programming since the age of 12 origin story. My origin story is the little engine that could barely make it out of the station equivalent to the programmer since age of 12 story. But my story nonetheless starts at the age of 12. In 1998, I was 12 years old and I grew up and I still live in the Bronx, um, the Bronx in New York City, which a lot of people equate with post-apocalyptic America. But in fact, it's a very beautiful and deeply flawed place. I grew up exactly two blocks away from the small cottage that served as the last home of esteemed American poet Edgar Allan Poe. I grew up a few blocks away from the high school that gave the world Stan Lee of Marvel Comics, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and the American designer Ralph Lauren. Yet the Bronx in the 1990s was definitely not a place where children were able to grow up free and happy. I grew up in a predominantly black and Latino community. Both of my parents are immigrants from the Dominican Republic. It was, it was an area um, of a lot of poverty. We had a huge um, issue with drug and gang violence. We had high, such a high incidence of sexual assault, I believe that it was just a matter of time between, until all of the women in my area were sexually assaulted in some way, shape, or form. And we also had a high incidence of burglaries and that was a particular ordeal that affected my family once. So my parents were very overprotective. They wouldn't let us go outside because it was too dangerous. So you can imagine being a 12 year old really frustrated at the fact that you have very few outlets to express yourself. Um, in addition to all of this, there were absolutely no extracurricular activities available for girls. And I've since come to understand that at many high poverty areas, this tends to be the case. So my brother was able to take karate and baseball and basketball, but there was absolutely no equivalent for girls. So I grew up without having participated in any sports, having done anything outside of school. So in 1998, when I was 12 years old, my dad decided to find a solution to this problem that we had the summer before seventh grade of school. And the problem was, well, it's too dangerous for you to go outside by yourself. So you're gonna be cooped in all day. So you're gonna be bored. So what do we do? 
he decided to invest in a desktop computer and dial up internet for my brother and I. Now, I grew up in an area and in a family where there were few computer literate adults, fewer still who understood the internet, but my dad rightly assumed that it would serve as a healthy distraction. So even though I was inside for most of my um, summer of seventh grade, I still look at that time very fondly. The internet opened up everything for me and allowed me to do all of the things that I wasn't able to do and really allowed me to um, go beyond the, the limits of my physical space. And uh, I learned HTML and I started creating my first websites. I was a huge fan of pop groups, so I decided that I wanted to be the definitive guide for all things NSYNC and the Spice Girls RIP. Um, and it went really well and I, and I hacked and I continued to, to to learn as much as I could about the internet, and I started chatting, and I got into blogging, but I never actually made the jump from HTML newbie to budding programmer. So every time I hear somebody's, I've been programming since I was eight year old story, I'm kind of like, how did you actually get access to that information? Because I, I, I struggle to see where in my youth I was able to make that connection. You see, I grew up in an area where the only professionals that existed were teachers, most of whom were white or they were social workers, or they were healthcare professionals like nurses, or they were civil servants. So those were really the only professions that most of us were left to aspire to. None of us knew anything about computer programming or engineering. None of us had any vocabulary to describe any of the things that we were seeing or interacting with. So even though I had access to the internet and to a computer, which was very unusual in this time and place, given that in 1998 in the Bronx, many people didn't have desktop computers and certainly didn't have dial-up internet, I wasn't able to make the jump without guidance. So I think for every person that we applaud for having been lucky enough to have been exposed to programming very young, I reckon that there are a lot of people who are more like 12-year-old Stephanie who could have made the jump but are not able to in the absence of guidance. <clears throat> so I do find that to be a little bit of a curiosity. The third qualification that I've determined that makes a remarkable technologist is contributing to technology. Now, I wanna go on to say that I haven't built amazing apps, I haven't added features to any awesome projects, and I haven't fixed a bug. My contributions to open source have been 100% non-technical, but I've been able to contribute because of the fact that I have technical skills. I know how to navigate the command line. I understand version control. I know how to use a text editor. So it's easier for me, as somebody who is decidedly non-technical, to be able to make those contributions um, versus someone who really doesn't understand the open source landscape and the technology landscape and how to make a contribution. <laughs> I made my first contribution to open source this past November by accident, actually. I was on Twitter, as I usually am, and a developer from the UK said, you know, I created this open source curriculum to teach sixth graders how to code, and I need somebody to go in and proofread and, and do some copy editing. And I'm a writer, so I was like, yeah, that's awesome, cool. So I did all the thing, you know, the git and the thing. I did all of that. And then I was like, okay, I think I contributed to open source, but to be sure, I decided to send Stephen a text message and ask him, did I contribute to open source? And he said, yes, you did. And I said, okay, awesome, that's cool. Um, because I didn't, I didn't really, you know, you, you, go, you go into GitHub and you'll see a project and you'll see that there'll be some contributor guidelines, but you don't really understand what that means. And I didn't have many people around me who talked about their contributions to open source. So I assumed that contributing to open source meant that you were contributing code and code only because most of these projects are in GitHub. So there's that assumption that you need to know how to code in order to be able to contribute. Um, also that you're contributing to a huge library or a huge gem or something, and then eventually your contributor skills would be so awesome that you'd be invited to be a member of a core team. That's how I thought it worked. Um, and it was still only another four months before I decided to make another contribution. And I was able to make this contribution and feel comfortable with where I was in the open source landscape when I attended a conference this past spring called Write, um, Write Speak Code in New York City, which is for women engineers. And uh, the last component of the conference is a session where all of the women are invited to contribute to open source. And, and it was essentially explained what it meant to contribute to open source. So I teamed up with a newbie um, with a code newbie, and I teamed up with a content marketer who had no technical skills, and I said, you know, I really wanna work on Girl Develop It's website. I think that they need to do some changes to their um, copy. So the content marketer um, and I, and you know, our fellow, our fellow um, beginner programmer set 
set to the races. And it was funny because the other content marketer said, you know, you're the technical one on the team. Even though I wasn't contributing any code, it's simply because I understood the Git workflow. And that was the only way that we were able to get this information up there. But I can't help but wonder about all of the times that I hear, you don't have to just contribute code to contribute to open source when when I find that it, it'd be very difficult for you as a non-technical person to be able to find out about these projects in the first place. And not just that, we're not telling people how they can contribute non-technical contributions to projects, especially when they're hosted on GitHub. So the assumption is gonna be that you need to learn how to code, you need to understand version control. Um, and not just that, like, what do you want me to contribute and how? Does this mean that because I'm not contributing any code, am I gonna get any visibility on the project, et cetera, et cetera? Um, whether we know it or not, we're being judged by the numbers of open pull requests that we have and all of the repositories that we have um, contributed to. So when you're a non-technical person and you don't have a, a presence on GitHub, you lose out from being able to say that you have contributed to technology simply because you're not able to, um, to use the resources that a lot of um, engineers are able to. So thinking about access, um, so, oh yeah, so I wanna go to um, thinking about um, technology and, and things that I've built that are beneficial for the community but aren't actual apps or resources. So um, I find it really interesting that we um, place a lot of attention on projects that have been built mostly from an engineering standpoint. So this spring I decided, well, you know, I think there should be a resource or there is something already um, to point people who are interested in getting involved in the tech community to find scholarships for, you know, diversity scholarships for conferences. I figured there's an app that exists already. Thankfully there is, um, a man of color developed something called Diversity Friendly, I soon found out. But um, I found that there wasn't something that was very readily available that you can say, okay, well there's a conference coming up in September and they have diversity scholarships and I want to apply. So I decided to create a Storify and amass all these tweets and put that out there. And I found that a lot of people were begging for this information, but no one had taken the time to actually create it. Something else that I figured that would have been an app already or would have been an online resource that would have been readily available would be a list of paid fellowships and apprenticeships around the country that pay people to learn how to program so they can go on to gainful employment. Come to find out that nothing like that exists already. So I created a Storify. Very simple, didn't do anything, no magic, nothing in the back end, just a simple storify and was able to get that information out there. But things that for me, because of my standpoint, I assume are common sense and should have been done already and technologists should have solved these problems, they haven't been solved. Um, and it's simply because of my experience and where I come from, um, I'm able to, to do that. <laughs> So I, I do want to go to access. Um, so continuing on the vein of open source contributions and access, um, I really want us to, all of us, I really want to invite everyone in this room to rethink what it means to have access to, to everything coding related, right? It's very easy to say, well, it's easy to find online resources to learn how to code. They're for free. All you have to do is look for them. Yeah, that's great, but there's a lot of hidden assumptions underneath that. Do you live in an area where you have internet broadband access? Do you have access to a desktop computer or a laptop computer? Are you using a certain browser? So there, there are all of these underlying assumptions around what it means to learn how to code that we have not solved yet as a, as a, as a community, and I think it's important. I found a statistic in Pew Research Institute which states that one out of five American adults is smartphone dependent. This means one of two things. One, Either they have few options outside of their phone's data plan to access the internet, or two, they only are able to get on the internet through their mobile phone. One out of five Americans. And the demographic breakdown of this is most smartphone dependent people tend to fall either into a few of these categories. They tend to be young American adults. They tend to have lower levels of income and, and educational attainment. And they also tend to overwhelmingly be people of color. So I think it's really important for us to, to take a step back and think about the things that we assume everyone has. People are still not there yet. And, um, we should really work accordingly to make sure that everybody's able to catch up. So the, the last points that I wanna make is about um, redefining what the remarkable technologist paradigm is. 
For me, I didn't come to technology from an analytical point of view, from a math science point of view, which I find to be very valid. Um, I don't have the origin story that I hear to be applauded, um, which is very valid. It's a very valid experience. But I come from the experience in which technology is not separate from society. Technology is not separate from your beliefs, and I firmly believe this. I don't believe technology is an amoral, emotionless, objective, amorphous, robotic thing that lives in space somewhere. It is very much a product of human thought. Technology and everything that we build is a form of human expression. And whether or not you are conscious of it, every single thing that you create, technical or not technical, you're creating with someone in mind. Whether it's yourself, your boss, other developers, or, or the users that are gonna be using this particular product, there's always somebody that you're thinking about and that you're writing about. So I think that's very important. That's a very important thought to revisit frequently when you're trying to think about access and making sure that you, that you don't have blind spots and that you at least are able to identify who these people are. So I wanna invite everyone to re-examine what they, what they think about when they think about remarkable technologists. I think that you don't have to be highly technical to be a technologist. I also want us to break away from coding as, a, as solely a, a means to an end and the end being a software engineer. I think that's awesome, but I'd love for us to break coding out of its current engineering role prison. I'd love for us to think about how accountants, how writers, how graphic designers can leverage programming to, to solve their real problems. And I don't think that's a stretch when we're trying to tell consumers, hey, your TV, your lamp, your door, your car, your watch is a computer. If we're able to tell them that, then we should be able to say, hey, you're a writer, you're a designer, you're an accountant, you're a teacher, you're a coder in some way, shape, or form, even if that doesn't benefit us as an engineering community. So I wanna say, let us continue to celebrate the 12 year olds who have gone on to be programmers. Let us continue to celebrate the people who um, love things about nerd culture or who use or who choose Zelda as their intro music. But let's also um, <laughs> let's also welcome the people like me who are the little engines that could, the little engines that could use coding but decided not to be developers, and the little engines that could who decided to use Beyonce's flawless as their intro music because we're remarkable technologists too. Thank you. Yeah.